because I think he's just been taught really, really poorly, right? I think he means well, quote unquote. There's a lot of people that mean well, but just because you mean well doesn't mean you're right. Hey everybody, welcome to Contra Thoughts. My name is Richard, and we've got some drama between Alan Parr and Marcus Rogers. We gotta talk about it, ladies and gentlemen. We gotta talk about it. Coming up next. All right, hey, so welcome, welcome. Um, lots of new subscribers lately. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for joining uh, the effort. Um, this is Contramundum. I'm Richard Contramundum, Richard against the world. That's what that means. Uh, the whole idea is being against the world, but for the world. Uh, so you might see pro mundo as well. So it's like, you know, pro, pros and cons, um, like contradiction or contrary. That's where that rude get, word gets from versus you're being pro-life or you're being, you know, pro-education or pro-gun or something like that. You're for those things. So against the world, but for the world. That's the goal of this channel. That's why I'm doing this channel is to help you uh, see that, to push against the world, push against Big Eva, push against weird things that are going on in the culture, in the church. Today, we're going to be talking about weird things that are going on in the church. Uh, now, we've got Marcus Rogers and um, Alan Parr. And just, uh, you know, no, might not know much about Alan Parr uh, or Marcus Rogers. Either way, they're both very big, influential guys and uh, lots of following. He's got over 600,000, Marcus Rogers, subs on YouTube, lots of people on Instagram and other places. Alan Parr's got like 850,000 subs. So we're talking like a million and a half people. Now there's some overlap. I'm sure people sub to both. But we're talking about over a million people who are being influenced across their platforms. Maybe maybe two million, I don't know. I, I don't have those analytics. I don't really care that much, but I can see the numbers, you can see the numbers. The point is, very influential. Now, Marcus Rogers has been known for saying a number of ridiculous things. He's very charismatic, very um, Pentecostally, oneness Pentecostal, meaning there's really just one God, which for lack of a better word, there's not, there is one God, but God is three persons. Now, there are heretics, uh, false teachers who teach modalism, where God the Father became Jesus the Son, and Jesus the Son became the Spirit. Um, that, I believe, is what Marcus Rogers teaches. Uh, he's also taught many other things, including you must speak in tongues, you must be baptized of the Holy Spirit. Um, there's just a lot of problems. So, for all intents and purposes, he's a false teacher. And many people have said this. Alan Parr has criticized him about a month and a half ago, maybe two months ago, at the end of 2021, he had a conversation. So we're going to look at this conversation. This video is going to be a little bit longer um, than my normal videos. I might break it up. I might not. I might just do one big chunk. Either way, we're going to do this and go through it. The speed is two times the speed, one and a half to two times. I kind of varied it a little bit uh, just because there's a lot of content here. And so we're going to move through it, okay? So this conversation was in late 2021, something like that. And that's the first question that I really want to ask you. Um, and and I, I want to hold you accountable today for what you said in the video. Your exact words were, Alan has not spoken in tongues and Alan does not have the spirit. So I, I want you to, I want you to, you know, tell me what is your position on, uh, well, not, I don't want to get into all the speaking in tongues thing, but what is your position on, do you believe that if somebody does not speak in tongues, they do not have the Holy Spirit? Is that, is that what you said in the video? So I just want to know what is your view on the connection between speaking in tongues and having the Holy Spirit? Is it okay if I go through, you know, my verses? Because I try to do like uh, as little talking as possible. I'd rather just kind of let, you know, the Bible talk because, you know, people would just take what you said or, or what I said rather. You know, I just rather like back it up with, with the Bible and that's okay with you. Yeah, I mean. That <laughs> is that okay with you? Uh, can we use the Bible? You know, I just want to use the Bible. This is just use the Bible. We're all using the Bible, man. We're all using the Bible. Okay, we're not, a, it's not a Mormon or a Muslim talking to a, a Christian, Okay. I mean, again, there's significant differences between Roman Catholicism and standard Protestantism or, you know, liberal leftist Christianity, which I, I would contest isn't even Christianity, but that's neither here nor there. They think they're Christians. And using this and saying, oh, love your neighbor, and over here saying, no, you have to do these things, blah, 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 blah. This is what the Bible says. Well, this is what the Bible says. Everybody uses the Bible, man. That doesn't, that doesn't work. I try and do a little talking as possible. Yeah, right. Marcus Rogers, he flaps his mouth way too much. Now, he's very passionate. I want to I wanna try to give the benefit of the doubt, right? And truthfully, just between you and me and anybody else who's watching, um, I actually have watched a number of videos on Marcus Rogers. And most of them are just like, okay, yeah, you know, whatever. You know, he went to a Waffle House and he got kicked out. This is in Chicago because they didn't have the mask mandate. 
uh, or they didn't have a mask and they didn't have their papers, you know. So he was joking about two black guys getting kicked out of a Waffle House, segregation, blah, blah, blah. And that's really what's actually going on. It is actual segregation. Um, and, okay, great. I'm glad you're standing up against that, the nonsense of the COVID stuff. Cool. Uh, I'm not talking about all his personal stuff and his accusations, the hashtag Me Too, and he's been accused of a bunch of stuff. There's been videos all over the internet recently uh, with people bringing that up and, and everything else. I'm not talking about any of that. I just want to talk about what he has said, what he has taught, and the things he is pushing. And Alan Parr is trying to build a bridge, and we'll see this later with a video that we look at next. That, that's good. I just I want to make sure we don't get too sidetracked on, on everything. But, but, but yes, I mean, by all means, we want you to use the scripture. But I, I just want to get a clear answer. Do you believe that, you know, before you go to the scripture, do you believe that whoever does not speak in tongues does not have the Holy Spirit in them? So I look at, um, you know, the Old Testament where um, if we, let's see, we go to a couple verses, you'll see that the Bible says that the Spirit would come upon uh, them. The Spirit came upon. Okay. The Old Testament never, ever, ever, ever talks about tongues. Correct me if I'm wrong. Drop a comment. Tell me I'm, I'm, I might have missed something. But there's no mention of tongues anywhere in the Old Testament as far as people speaking in tongues. In fact, it's quite the opposite in Babel, right, where there's one language and it gets broken up. And then Pentecost, Acts 2 in particular, and Pentecostals love Pentecost, Pentecostal, right? They love Acts. Now, I'm preaching through Acts. I'm not a Pentecostal. Acts, we can learn much from the early church and how she dealt with certain problems, mainly persecution, uh, how unity is developed and doctrines developed, how church government should be, and so on. Acts is a wonderful book. Luke is an amazing writer. That being said, we don't get a lot of our doctrine from Acts, but more on that later. The Spirit came upon David when he was anointed. The Spirit came upon Gideon. And so there's a difference between the Spirit coming upon the person uh, or even the Spirit, you know, moving in their life. Or they say, oh, I went to church and I felt the Spirit and being filled with the Spirit, as we see in the Bible, you know, people being mad. I want to say this right from the jump. I did not come on here to condemn anybody. I didn't come on here to tell anybody, oh, you're not saved. You're, you know, you're going to hell. Yeah, okay, um, great. The way that I look at it, I always use Acts 19 as my reference. You know, Paul, he went up to these believers and they were believers. They believed, you know, in the gospel and all that. And, all that, and he asked them, had you been, had you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said, you know what? We know not whether there be a Holy Ghost. And so, you know, to Paul, it was an important issue, and that's why he brought it up. So I believe if you look at the Old Testament, there's a difference between the Spirit coming upon you and then in the New Testament actually being filled with the Holy Spirit. So, the, yeah, that's right. There is a difference. But there's no talking about speaking in tongues. What? Like, he's talking about, hey, so do you believe if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved? Well, you know, in the Old Testament, it doesn't mention cars. Therefore, we shouldn't have cars. Uh... I mean, yeah, but like, you know, are cars bad for the environment though? Should we all drive, you know, Priuses or Teslas? Yeah, I mean, you know, when when you look back at Adam and Eve, they didn't have they didn't have roads or manufacturing, so you know, that's just that's just something to think about. What? Like, what are you talking about? Like, how are you referencing tongues when there's no mention of tongues in the Old Testament? Same thing. Uh, it... So, I guess the, the first question I have Alan Parr's is already frustrated. I really want to get the answer to your He's question. Already, do you like... believe that if you know, to answer my question, do you believe that if somebody doesn't speak in tongues? that they do not have the Holy Spirit. Ask him again. Is that, is that your position? I'm only asking that because that's what you said in the video. So I'm just, that's the only reason I'm asking is, I'm just trying to I mean, you said you it. what you believe and what you might teach other people. Uh, do you believe that if, if somebody doesn't speak in tongues, they don't have the Spirit in them? And I, I'm asking that because the implication behind somebody not having the Spirit means they're not saved. Because the Bible talks about, you know, whenever you uh, place your faith in Christ, we are all baptized in one spirit. Um, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3.16, your bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6.19, uh, once again, you know, you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, so to suggest that tongues is tied to possessing the Spirit and ultimately tied to someone's salvation is a pretty big statement. This or so. In the Old Testament, when the Spirit came upon them, they did great, great exploits, right? In the New Testament, when you look at Acts 19, Acts 10, Acts 2, every time uh, they were filled with the Spirit, the evidence was that they spoke in tongues. Now, why I'm not going to get on here and, and like, uh, just throw people in hell or something like that is because that's not what Paul did. Paul asked them, he said, hey, have you received the Holy Ghost? And uh, their answer was they didn't know. And so he prayed for them, and when he prayed for them, they spoke in tongues. That's the same thing that happened, you know, Acts 19, Acts 10, Acts 2. Every single time they spoke in tongues. And so, to me, the, according to the Bible, the tongues is the evidence. Two minutes in, right about here. Um, and we had the whole conversation. He said no. So right there, me and him are going to bump heads on a lot of things because he don't have the spirit of God. This is later in the video. Uh, and, and, and so this is later in the video. So he's he's uh, this is still the same conversation. We're looking at two different conversations. One he had with him. It's like an hour and forty five minutes. I'll put it in the comment uh, description, and I'll put the other one. It's a fifteen minute video. We'll look at of why he's still with Marcus Rogers, as it were. He's supporting him still. Um, this is. Alan Parr watching a video of Marcus Rogers, and then he's addressing it, and then, of course, I'm watching it, and now we're starting to get this weird, like, my son last night put up a mirror in front of the bathroom mirror, you know, this little makeup mirror my wife has, and it was like, <laughs> he was all weirded out, he's like, ah, oh, does it ever end? I'm like, it doesn't ever end, he was so mystified, he's, uh, he just turned six, so he's very impressed. 
So we're looking at a video, looking at video, looking at it. Right. Hope you're tracking. Still tracking. This is long, but stick with me because this is very important stuff. I think it's very important. I could be wrong. Drop me a comment. Let me know if you've found this helpful so far. To see why our perspectives are different, different on a lot of things, right? Now watch this. Mark 16, 17, 18. I just want to say this in the very beginning. And that last video that he did, he didn't have no Bible to really back up what he was saying. All right. So in these times, you probably believe in my name should have cast out devils. They should speak with tongues. I don't see how anybody can argue with that, but they do. Jude 120. Okay, now that that's right there. That's the that's the first thing that I really have to address. Okay. And this is the danger of taking scriptures out of context. It's the danger of why we have so many false teachings today and things of that nature. All right. Now, the scripture that you read is in Mark. They take things out of context. Amen, amen, amen. Yeah, they do that. False teaching is abounds with that sort of thing. And notice, and we'll get into it here, Acts. Mark 16 isn't original. It isn't original. And this is where he's getting so much of his doctrine. It's very spurious. It's a fancy word for, you know, sketchy, right? It's very, it's just, uh, I don't know. Like the Mormons do this sort of thing, right? They add, they take, they this, they that. You know, people say, well, you know, the, the King James is the only translation. Did you not? You know, Jesus, it was good for Jesus, good for me. Like, that's just silly. It's silly. And a lot of Christians do that. A fundamentalist do that. Uh, he, Marcus Rogers, apparently is KJV only, mostly. It's interesting, which is very weird because most Charismatics and Pentecostals are NIV, New Living Translation, Message, uh, or even worse, the Heresy Version, um, the Passion Translation. That's a terrible, terrible, it's not even translation. But anyway, um, wanted to just say that. Let's go back. So the first problem with Mark 16 is that if you go to any study Bible whatsoever, it doesn't matter what type of Bible you go to, you're going to clearly see a note on that page that says verses 9 through 20 of Mark chapter 16 are not in the earliest manuscripts. So from the jump, just starting off, you're dealing with a very questionable portion of Scripture that may or may not have even been in the original manuscripts or some of the earlier manuscripts, should I say. And you can see that in any study Bible. But let's just for our sake of argument assume that Mark 16 is part of the biblical canon. It is supposed to be in there. Okay, no problem. The issue that a lot of people make and the issue that I see that you made in this video is that you read the first verse but you actually didn't read the verse that came after it. Now, this verse says, these miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name and they will speak in new languages, okay? Both of those are relatively easy to say, uh, you know, yeah, I've cast out some demons, I've spoken tongues. But now when we add this next verse, they will be able to handle snakes with safety and if they drink anything poisonous, it will not, it won't hurt them. They will be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. Now, any Bible student at all can clearly see that there is no possible way to do proper biblical exegesis and assume that every believer is going to experience, experience A and B without experiencing experience A, B, C, and D, and E, because it says in this text, all who believe will accompany these signs. And it names what? Uh, uh, it names uh, casting out demons, speaking in new tongues, handling snakes, drinking anything poison, and placing their hands on the... That's right. So he's talking, he's saying if, if A and B follows, then C follows, D, and so on like that. So he, again, he's saying, listen, this is not normal, okay? Now, if you take the abnormal and you make it normal, that's a problem. And that's what people do all the time. This is why we have so many cults and sects and groups and just aberrant forms of whatever. People see a verse or two and they say, this is my marching order. Like he just said, I take Acts 19 as my go-to, blah, blah, blah. He's already admitting it. And that's what I want to say, to drag his feet over and say, look it. But you can't just take that. Now, of course, he would say he's taking other verses and he's taking the whole Bible and the whole canon, blah, 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 blah. And everybody says that. But you have to remember, ladies and gentlemen, Friends, dear friends. I watch a video sometimes. She says, dear friends. It's kind of awkward, but anyway. Uh, you are my friends. Digital friends. No, I appreciate the communication. Drop a comment. I always I always uh, interact with comments. So if you found this helpful so far, uh, tell me. Maybe I'm off. Maybe Alan Parr is amazing or he's not. Or Marcus Rogers is amazing or he's not. Or maybe I'm not amazing. Um, either way, let me know. I'd like to know whether I'm amazing or not. <laughs> You can't just take some or few verses and just say, this is it. This is what we're going to do. It's very, very dangerous. Not biblically accurate to pick and choose which of those five biblically you accurate. want to say, right. okay, believers will experience, all believers will experience this, but not all believers will be able to pick up snakes and not get bit. Not all believers will be able to drink poison and not, and not die. And not all believers will be able to place their hands on anyone who is sick and they will be healed. We know that these things are not things that the majority of believers can do, right? And so why is it that we say, well, if that's the case, that all believers, here's the reality of what that text is actually talking about, right? And also the text that you mentioned in the book of Acts. Oh, okay, hold on, hold on. Before I get into Acts, let me make sure my position is very clear because sometimes I am presented in a way that is not consistent with my belief. So let me, let me first start off by presenting my view on the gifts of the Spirit, okay? He's very clear here. Very, very clear. Alan Parr is really trying to be charitable. And this is where I appreciate him. And I know some people, oh, it's a dumpster fire. He's crazy. He's just pandering, whatever, whatever. Uh, I don't know. We're not there yet. I'm not there yet. This is a good video so far, at least. This is an hour and 45 minutes. Go check it out if you haven't seen it already, if you want to. Uh, I'll put it in the description. 
He's trying to be charitable. I think sometimes he's a little too middle of the road, but he's also got like 850,000 subs. Guarantee not all those people are Christians. Guarantee not all those people are Orthodox. Guarantee not all those people are even going to a healthy church. They're part of a, a legit men's, women's Bible study. They're studying the scripture daily. They're memorizing scripture. They've got great marriages. They're parenting their children or grandchildren or whatever. Like most of those people, like all of us, are, are messed up in some way. Right? Nobody's perfect except for Christ. So he's got a broad audience. And the bigger the audience, the more you've got to please people. That's what happens with this whole uh, cancel culture nonsense that we see so often these days. My view, the, my view on the gifts of the Spirit. It's not for me to say what you do within your own time, behind closed doors, between you and your God. However you want to talk to God, however you want to pray, however you want to communicate with God is your business and God's business. I'm not going to get in between that, right? If you want to speak in tongues, that's okay. But my only position that I have stand, stood firm on on this channel, you can look at every video I've done on tongues, is within the context of a church service. If you have some people who are speaking in tongues without there being an interpreter, even Paul said, because I don't want... Yes, you need an interpreter if you're going to have tongues. I went to a rally revival, quote unquote. Uh, this is in Northern California. It was with uh, a relative, we'll just say. And yeah, there were people all around speaking in tongues. And by speaking in tongues, I mean... See, I'm not an idiot. Now, I'm not like that smart, really, at all, but I'm not an idiot. And when people are like, that's not a language. That's Babel. Literally Babel, which is exactly why the Tower of Babel was called the Tower of Babel. Now, they were actually speaking in different languages because the Lord went down and confounded their languages because they were disobeying. That's the difference. However... You can't really articulate that very well with a word and say, well, they're speaking, eh, it's still, even in Acts, it says, wish, what does this babbler wish to say? Now, Paul is speaking about things. It's an insult, right? He's speaking their language, but he's talking about foreign deities, foreign concepts. This God who created the heavens and the earth and all things in it doesn't dwell in temples made by hands. He doesn't need anything from humanity. And he, he, he's calling out everyone to repent, et cetera, et cetera. That's babble to the unbeliever. I'm talking about just straight, like, baby talk. One and a half year old, one year old, six month old, cooing and gooing and blah, 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 blah like, literal nonsense. I've experienced it. Now, does that mean it always happens? No, because I'm not omniscient. I'm not going to say that. However, I have a pretty good suspicion that's what happens, you know, 99% of the time. I'm not, I, I don't know. I'm not a hardline cessationist and I'm not a hardline continuationist. I think... God, because time is present everywhere for the Lord, right? A thousand years from now and a thousand years ago is all, and right now, is all present with the Lord, right? Just let that sink in for a moment. To, quote, put God in a box, I think is uh, wrong. There's no scripture that says, you know, now there is 1 Corinthians 13, when the perfect comes, the, the partial will be done away with. That's not talking about, that's talking about death. That's not talking about the canon. That's not talking about tongues. That's not talking about anything. Now, I think... Uh, Paul does talk about tongues, and he does talk about that there seems to be a level of waning and waning um, going on. And we see that he appoints certain people as prophets, uh, apostles, teachers, so on and so forth, right? It's not a hard line, right? And that's, and that's the struggle that a lot of people want to. We all want to, especially as Western American Christians, we want to put everything in a box. Black and white, black and white, black and white. You know, night and day. This is what it is. Yes and no. Green and red. You know, back, 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 back. And just stick everything in. Like, all right, whew, I've got my theology all wrapped up. I understand the desire. I want that too. The problem is, I don't believe that that's what the scripture has. Now, that doesn't mean God's chaotic. It just means that God is far bigger than us and far more immense than we can possibly imagine. Not only because... He dwells everywhere with everyone all at once, according to his time. But in our time, there's a linear scale from creation to the present day. That being said, most of the stuff that's tongues ain't tongues. It's babble. It's literal nonsense. It's gibberish. And that's what Marcus Rogers is saying. And then Alan Parr's like, all right, fine. You want to have tongues? I guess. But you got to have an interpreter because that's what the scripture says. Because if I start speaking Spanish, which, you know, we've all heard those missionary stories and whatever. I'm not going to discount those. I know there's Justin Peters and people like that. They're like, no, nah, that doesn't happen. You know, there's no visions in Mormon or uh, Muslim land, you know, in the Middle East, blah, blah, blah. It's like, you, you, you don't know that, man. You don't know that. Sorry. You don't know that. But the point is, I'm not going to discount it. I'm, I'm going to be highly critical of it at best. I'm going to be uh, highly critical of it 
and not just accept it willy-nilly. Marcus Rogers' discernment, because I think he's just been taught really, really poorly, right? I think he means well, quote unquote. There's a lot of people that mean well, but just because you mean well doesn't mean you're right. Fusion in the church. I would rather speak five intelligible or understandable words than 10,000 words in a tongue. Because Paul understood that when I speak in tongues, I'm going to confuse people who don't understand what I'm saying, particularly if there's no interpretation. And that is my main position. Which, by the way, there's other people in the book of Acts who got saved and did not speak in tongues. All through the book of Acts, particularly, I want to say the day of Pentecost, where over 3,000 people were added to the church, and there's yeah. a tradition of them speaking in tongues there. So we, what we're doing is we're taking isolated incidents who happened to these people, and then we're saying, because these stories happened, we are therefore going to now say that every single believer who comes after that can have the exact same experience. But if we want to go to doctrine, we've got to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul clearly says, do all prophesy? No. Do all cast out demons? No. Do all do signs and miracles? No. And then do all speak in tongues? No. It's impossible to read 1 Corinthians 12 and look at Paul's line of questioning and come away and say, well, wait. Paul clearly said not everybody is going to speak in tongues. Why? Because of the spiritual gift. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 says the, uh, the Spirit of God issues those gifts to whom he wills, right? Uh, and so I think that's one of the big fallacies that I think a lot of people make with regard to tongues. Um, if it, indeed it is a gift, then a spiritual gift is not something you can bargain and ask God for. It's something that clearly the Bible says, First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, the Spirit of God distributes these gifts as he sees fit. And that's my position on that. And very clear, right? Very, very clear. And Paul, right, he says... Does all do this? No. Does all do this? No. Does all do this? No. Does all, <laughs> like, you can't, and Marcus Rogers, and this is where I would say, I agree with Marcus Rogers, and I agree with Alan Parr, somewhat, right? Marcus Rogers saying, hey, I'm just going to use the Bible. I agree with that. I want, you know, I just want to lift up God. I want to do this, praise him. Great. I agree with that. Uh, you know, there's no contradictions in the Bible. I agree with that. And if the contradiction is, it, it lies with the interpreter. Yeah, I agree with all that. The difference is, he's doing it incorrectly, <laughs> He, he, his, his interpretation of Mark 16, which isn't original uh, at all, if anything, it, ad, it was added after the fact when Acts was written and looking at Paul who, you know, had the asp and the snake hung on his, um, came out of the fire when the ship wrecked, right? They get on the beach and they do the fire and the snake comes out and bites him and he just shakes it off and they're like, oh, he's going to die. And then the people are like, oh, he must be a god. And he's like, he's not god. You know, like, we know the story. It's Acts 25, 26, something like that. It's toward the end. I haven't preached it yet. But he's saying, oh, there's a problem with interpretation. There is no contradiction in the scripture. Amen, Marcus Rogers. Amen, man. I can agree with that. The problem is, yes, your interpretation is wrong. Not mine, not Alan Parr's, not other people who are criticizing you. You're wrong <laughs> because you're saying, oh, everybody should speak in tongues. And if you haven't spoken in tongues, that means you're not a Christian or that means you haven't had the spirit or that means something else. He has this old covenant dispensation and this view to say the, the spirit came upon people, but you aren't filled. Well, yes, it, he did come upon people, and you're not filled, not like we are in the New Covenant. There is a distinction. All right, so there's a couple things that I want to say about that. I guess, so, uh, you know, with Mark 16, you're, the first thing you said was, was, if you have a study Bible, that verse isn't technically, you know, supposed to be there. But I don't believe that. I also believe the second part, they shall take up serpents, that they drink any deadly thing that shall not hurt them. I believe that this verse in 18 is pretty much saying that we're going to be protected. In West Virginia, this is still a practice in some churches. It's still legal. It's snake handling, right? Based on this verse. And people die based on this verse. That's stupid. And the world looks at that and says, you guys are idiots. That's dumb. And it's like, that is dumb because it's not in the scripture. Where does Jesus handle snakes? Do, they, do we even handle snakes in Acts, your whole thing? Do we see this anywhere else in any of the other gospels, any of the epistles, anything anywhere? No. In fact, snakes bite people and poison people in, oh, I don't know, where? The Old Testament, right? And they're a sign of judgment. They're a sign of people under condemnation. But... What does Jesus say? Just as the snake was lifted up in the wilderness, God tells, tells Moses to make the bronze snake to lift it up and the people will look to the snake and they will be healed. Just as the snake was lifted up in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. Look to Christ. If you've not looked to Christ, turn to Christ. Look to him. Trust Jesus. He's better and bigger than your sin. He is. And don't say you haven't sinned. You've sinned. You've lied. You've cheated. You've stolen. You've committed adultery. You've had other gods. You've had other idols. You've done it. Absolutely. Jesus calls you to turn from your wickedness and embrace him. That's what he calls you to do. Now, I don't, I don't know Marcus Rogers' heart or Alan Parr. I really don't. We can really just look at the fruit. We can really just look and understand um, that these guys are doing these things. Right Now, no, we're not perfect. But the trouble is when people do stumble and fall, and especially if the Spirit convicts that person, him or her, and other people come along and say, hey, you know what? Ah, man, that wasn't right. You missed up there. The Scripture actually says this. You really shouldn't treat your wife like that. You really should, you know, do this with your children. You, you really shouldn't um, talk that way. That's, you know, that's too, that's not glorifying. That's honoring to the Lord, etc. That's a problem, right? But 
if we say these other things and they push back, and that person who's being corrected pushes back and says, no, no, I'm right. We see this all the time with Big Eva, right? Tim Keller, Russell Moore, uh, David Platt. A lot of these people, they go to defense. When they're wrong, they're you know race baiting, they're adding to the gospel, they're changing scripture, twisting scripture, doing all these things. I've got a bunch of videos if you want to check out some of these up here. Um, that's what happens. But instead of being corrected, they're saying, ah, uh, no, 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 no. You don't know what you're talking about. I am right. You're wrong. Or they just dig in their heels and they push back further. Not that you should go uh, grab a snake. You know, unless God is, the, you know, directing you or telling you to do certain things. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's Peter stepping off the boat. People will say, oh, Peter, you know, you, you shouldn't do that. Right? So if you go do something out of your own carnality or, you know, feelings or emotions, then, yeah, you can get yourself messed up. But I believe that that verse is simply saying, uh, if you believe nothing's going to hurt you, nothing's going to harm you, they shall lay hands on the sick and shall recover. So even right there, this ties into, I believe, what we're saying in Corinthians. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. We read about the gift of faith, the gift of healings, the gift of knowledge. And what a lot of people don't understand, there's a difference between being baptized in the Holy Ghost, evidence, speaking in tongues, which we see in Acts 2, Acts 10, Acts 19. And, um, as you're talking about in church speaking tongues, needing there to be an interpreter. What do you believe the gift of tongues? If you don't mind me asking, what do you believe the gift of tongues? I'm going to cut you off, but I want to make sure we're clear. When you say the gift yeah, of tongues, I'm going to go right into that. Okay. okay. So Jude one twenty says, I didn't mean to cut you off. Sorry. No, you're okay, brother. It's, it's all good. Jude, Jude one twenty says, but ye beloved, building up yourself on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Right. So we look at Mark sixteen. It says believers are going to uh, speak in tongues. Then you look at Jude one twenty, and it's a command. He corrects him. Jude. Jude's not talking about tongues. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in. Praying without ceasing. Praying being filled with the spirit, right? We can call and say, Lord, fill me with your spirit. Please, please dwell with us in your spirit. Why? Because we can also quench the spirit. And I know some people get all weirded out with that certain theological traditions, but you can resist the Holy Spirit. Jesus talks about that. We see this in Acts as well. You know, we, you're resisting the Holy Spirit. And, that is, and this is where I'm going back and forth, the night and day sort of everything's in a box. Certain people, I just got to put everything in a box. If you mean resist the Holy Spirit, that means you're more powerful than God. Is that what that means though? No. Is anyone saying that? You know, the most, you know, free will Arminian person? No, they're not saying that. Nobody's saying I'm more powerful than God. No Christian anyway. But a lot of, you know, reform, Calvinist, hardline, whatever, determinists and things will say, oh, you're not powerful. And they get all upset. And it's like, no, that's not what they're saying. But at the same time, what does it say? Well, the scripture is saying, don't resist, don't quench, don't, don't do these things. Now, it's not always talking about salvation, right? It's talking about this, this prompting, this leading, this stuff that you see the conviction, right? We still sin, and all sin is just unbelief, right? We're not faithfully walking. We're not believing the Lord's promises for us in our life, whether we lust or whether we cheat or whether we lie. We're believing something else, not the Lord, when we sin, right? And remember 1 John we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. When we sin, I pray that you don't sin, but when we do, when you do sin, okay? That's All right, so yes, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. We have the Lord, okay? And that's something that we must remember. We must remember these things because if we don't, then we're lost, right? We're, we're, how are we? We're just a ship across the ocean with no anchor, no sails, no compass, nothing. And this is what we see with most people. This is why most people have massive problems in their lives, even Christians, because we're not anchored in Christ. We're not seeing him as our sure and steadfast anchor, the anchor of our soul, that despite what's going on outside, whatever's going on, even inside, mentally, physically, sexually, urges, desires, all that stuff, if you're anchored in Christ, you are a new creation. The old things have died. The old things have passed away. And behold, all things, all things, Become new. Back, Back to the video. To uh, build up your most holy faith, pray in the Holy Ghost. What does that mean? So what does it mean to pray in the Holy Ghost? Well, right. we look at Romans 8. It says, likewise, the Spirit also helps with our infirmities, for we know not that we should, what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit is in intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Um, and then, you know, you read it because it says with groanings that are truly like, words. That's like the modern English version. I like to stick with the King James version, but it pretty much is saying with groanings which cannot be uttered. And I don't know what to pray for myself or pray for my own. So the Spirit is making intercession on my behalf. Believers of all kinds. So here's my question. If, if Paul says, not all believers will speak in tongues, if Paul says that, how then can another biblical writer who is also filled with the same Holy Spirit make an order or a command that every believer speak in tongues when Paul clearly says not everybody's going to speak in tongues or pray in tongues? How can you command a believer to do something that they've not been gifted to do? That doesn't make any logical sense. If both biblical writers are under the same influence inspired by the Holy Spirit, there cannot be a command. Now, there is a command to be filled with the Spirit, but once again, being filled with the Spirit doesn't mean speaking in tongues. We know what being filled with the Spirit is. We can look at that in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. We'll get to that in a little while. But how can a biblical writer make a command, pray in tongues, and then another biblical writer say, oh, but not every believer is going to have to give the tongues? Exactly. So that's my whole point. The Bible cannot contradict itself. So if there's a contradiction, then it has to be with that individual's interpretation. Did you get that? The Bible cannot contradict itself. Amen, Marcus Rogers. Yeah, I can sing that, tweet that. I can put that on Gab. I can do everything. By the way, if you want to watch me on Gab or follow me on Gab, Genesis 3.17. 
Uh, I'm not on Twitter, although I might go back to Twitter. I don't know. It's been several years. Probably not, though. I'm also on Facebook, but that's just my wife and I's page. So if you really want to get a hold of me, besides here is Gab. I'm on Pyrler, I guess, and I signed up for Getter, but I feel like that's just, I feel like it's kind of like a hack website. But anyway, uh, the Bible cannot contradict itself. Yes, amen, Marcus Rogers, right? And if there is a contradiction, it's with the person doing it, right? Interpreter, yeah, amen. But you're the one who's interpreting it wrong, not me. <laughs> <laughs> or, or or people who are interpreting in the sense of the, pa, Paul says in a command, and this is where the difference is. Paul says in a command, this doesn't happen for everybody. Okay? So that's 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 a statement. It's not a command, it's a statement. But you take that as doctrine to build on that. Whereas talking about somebody being rose risen from the dead, rise from the dead. Or, you know, a lame man walking, paraplegia guy, begging alms, right? Look, getting, getting coins in the temple. And we see this in Acts 3. Peter and John are there. They heal the man right away in the power of Jesus' name. Now, can that happen? I believe Jesus can not only save us physically uh, or spiritually, but physically. He can heal us. Absolutely. Do I have the um, ability, quote unquote, to do that? No. Peter and John didn't have the ability to do that either. It was all in Christ. And one thing we must remember, and I don't think I said this yet, is signs and wonders and miracles. There are three different words in the, especially in Acts. And this is something that I learned doing the study. This is why it's so great to just really dig into a book and study and look at the words, look at the, look at the parallels, look at how the words are used differently throughout the scripture, throughout the, um, I call it authorial context, where you're both the author of Luke and Acts is Luke. Now, some people believe he even wrote Hebrews and other things like that. That's not what I'm talking about. The point is you can see how he uses certain phrases in Luke and compare that to Acts or vice versa. Now, you look at the broader context of the New Testament and then the whole Bible, but authorial context would say, well, what does Paul mean when he's talking about this in Romans? Well, that's a little interesting because he's referencing the Old Testament, but he also talks about it in Colossians or Thessalonians or whatever. And you can see within how the author uses words because I use words differently than some of my friends uh, or, or fellow pastors and that sort of thing as well, right? I even use words differently than my wife does. Now, we're married, right? We're from the same culture. We're from the same generation. And yet, I use words slightly different than she does and she does for me. So it's not always exactly the same. So it's good to know what the author is saying. That being said, he's talking about the Bible and what does it mean? Well, what does it mean? Yes, what does it mean? It's the context. Paul says, this doesn't happen. And then he's saying, oh, but this description over says... Oh, uh, yeah, you're all being baptized with the Spirit. Well, that's not speaking in tongues. He's misinterpreting and misreading, intentionally or unintentionally, he's doing it. When we look at First Corinthians 14, it's exactly what you said. It's talking about church etiquette, right? So verse 2, he says, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue, speaketh not unto man, but unto God. As you said, you know, Pastor, you were it's, it's me speaking to God. It's for my edification. God is no respected person. Peter says, right, uh, that the promise is unto you, unto your children, unto your children, and all their father, right? So we go back to the verses that we read initially. Peter like a big pot. Person, like he's just, he's just like throwing in a bunch of stuff. Uh, stuff. He's, he's just, just stirring it around in his like false teaching cauldron. And the Bible says in the last days, I'm going to pour my spirit upon all flesh. So when you look at when the Gentiles receive the Holy Ghost, it says, man, they were shocked. We thought this was just for us. So my point is this, that it's for everyone. The gift of tongues, which I've experienced, is different, right? So the Bible says in Mark 16 that you should lay hands on the sick and recover. But some people operate in the gift of the healing. Some people operate in the gifts of word of knowledge. It's the same thing with the gift of tongues and Bible talking about etiquette. There have been times where we've been in church and we're worshiping and we kind of just go silent and we're just waiting and somebody will just bust out in tongues and everybody's listening. We always have someone interpret for the edification of the church. That, that is the gift of tongues. That's not the same as being baptized in the Holy Ghost. And that's why when usually when we talk about this, the only verse people can go to is the one here in Corinthians because all the other places in the Bible, and then Paul would be contradicting himself. In Acts 19, he goes up to these people who are believers. Now, if he went there and he said, look, sorry, guys. So he literally, he literally contradicts himself. He literally just said, hey, these people, this is the only verse you have to say that not everybody speaks in tongues. Well, first of all, that's all we need is just one. That's all you need for anything. Uh, and then he does the same thing. Well, my go-to verse, Acts 19. <laughs> like Now he uses other verses too, but there's also other verses that say that this is going to pass away. This is not going to last. And evidence is clear. There are no tongues in the Old Testament. There's no tongues at all in the New Testament or in the Gospels. And there's almost no tongue spoken anywhere besides Acts. Now, they're mentioned here and there, and I understand these are epistles, you're or an epistle, just writing, right? That's just, you're writing a letter to your friend or your colleagues or something like that, and you're saying, hey, this, 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 this. You're not talking about probably what you ate for breakfast or some, you know, how you tied your shoes. Now, those are just mundane things. But if a miracle happens, oh, did I say this? Did I say this? I don't know. I'm, I'm just all over the place today. Signs, wonders, and, and 
I did start to say it and then I got sidetracked. I do that. Sorry. Signs here, like what? Go back to your thing. Signs, miracles, and wonders. Those are three different things. Again, the benefit of studying the scripture. These are all three different things and they're all there to always affirm the message. Okay, that's something that you must put that in your back pocket. Whether you're charismatic or you lean that way or you're like, no, I'm a heart sensationist, put that in your back pocket. These things are affirmations of what the scripture, the message is saying, right? So whether it was Jesus or the apostles, there was a new covenant being established, right? The Messiah is here. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Well, that's kind of newsflash, right? The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the uh, the the people of the day didn't anticipate much, most of this, right? They thought something else. And so we ha- he had to do X, Y, Z, miracle, signs and wonders. And now there are plenty of signs and wonders that he didn't do, Jesus namely, right? And he goes back to even... Uh, Elijah or or some of the others healing uh, the <clears throat> excuse me the uh, leprosy or widows raising raising the one son from the dead and that sort of thing like but were there not more widows in in Judea in Israel not Judea Israel uh, in the land and so on yes there were but there's only one that did had the sign and the wonder of the miracle and so. Yes, the axe heads float. Yes, there's this. Yes, there's the talking donkey from the Old Testament. There's plenty of things. Balaam's donkey, if you know that. There's a lot of weirdness in the Bible because the Bible is weird. Just because it's weird doesn't mean it's wrong, right? Reality is weird. (laughs) Uh, And we're so sanitized in our modern age that we think, oh, if it's weird, it's not right, and this and this and this. He's saying we don't have the Bible, and the Bible's not the Word of God. This Bible right here isn't enough is what he's saying. This is what he's saying. This is the same thing the leftists say. This is the same thing that the woke people say. This is the same thing um, that that Mormons say. The same thing that Muslims say. The same thing that Roman Catholics say. The Bible is not enough. That's what they say. They all say it. Charismatics do the same thing. I need experience. I want to feel something. God spoke to me. I this. I felt. uh, I urge. I want. Listen, I've had times where I've spoken something or I've said stuff that I was not planning, especially preaching. And I feel, uh, I know that the spirit is dwelling with me. Now, does he always? No, because sometimes maybe I've sinned. I've not prepared as well. I've not fed my mind. And then he uses that in the proclamation of his word. I'm not trying to get weird here, but if you're just reading your manuscript, that's, I don't believe the same thing. That's just, you're reading, you're you're not preaching, you're not yielding to the spirit and saying, you work, right? Because how else is he going to work? He doesn't have a body. He works through believers. He works through people. He works through the word of God. He convicts and exhorts and he, he, he lifts up and encourages, right? And convicts the world of righteousness. He does. And I say it, that's not what I meant. He does. So the point is, the Bible is sufficient. And that's really what Marcus Rogers is saying. It's not sufficient. I need this. I need, we were worshiping and all of a sudden we went quiet. Somebody was just like, and we can watch these videos. You've seen these nonsensical videos on online, right? You've seen this. They're not, they're not, it's not tongues, man. You're just literally babbling. And guess what? There's also no interpreter. I've never seen one of these people. Now, I've only watched, you know, probably a few dozen videos over the years. But I've never seen anyone go, whether it's Kenneth Copeland or any of these other clowns, Todd Bentley, Todd White, all these guys. They tell these stories, right? And they don't, they don't actually have any evidence for it. Now, I just told a story that I don't have any evidence for, but I hope you get what I mean. You can go back and look at them. I'm, it's not, I'm not making stuff up. And there's no interpreter. They're not there actually interpreting anything. And the best part is, it's not needed. We don't need it. We don't need it. We just don't. Okay? You don't need it. Because why do you need it? Building up edification. What about the word? What about praying? What about what about talking with people? Is that is that not good enough? That's what he's saying. The Bible's not good enough. The cessationists have a good argument for, you know, the partial will be done away with. Again, I don't believe that's talking about the, the canon of Scripture. Um, I believe that's talking about death, uh, where because we see in this glass dimly, but then we'll see him face to face. We don't see Jesus face to face with the closing of the canon. So, sorry guys, but again, it's a, it's a good start to an argument because I understand your sentiment because you don't want people running around like Marcus Rogers doing this Looney Tune stuff. Because people are using a really isolated incident and you're not, not the right to all the other incidents. Actually, this is my point.
the point is the Bible can contradict itself. So Paul did that in Acts 19, and he goes in there, and everybody gets a holy ghost. Everybody's speaking in tongues. Acts 10, Acts 2, all of them are receiving it. And no place in time where they think they only shown you have it. He just says the promise of you and your children. Then Joel chapter 2 says that well, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. So here, he says, what, he says, what do you see happening? All right, this is the second video. So this is yesterday. Man, Marcus Rogers is slippery. He's a slippery cat, as they say, a slippery cat, like an eel or a catfish. Catfish are gross looking. Have you ever seen a catfish up close? I do not agree with the types of videos that he puts out with regards to saying, God told me this in a dream, God told me that. I'm pulling snakes out of people's backs and things like that. I don't agree with his position on the baptism of the Holy Spirit and tongues being the evidence of speaking in tongues. I don't agree with his position on the Trinity. And I'm sure there are other points of theology. Okay, so this is the second video. This just dropped. So the first video was like six weeks ago, seven weeks ago, something like that. End of 2021. This is another video where he hasn't said much at all. And a lot of people have roasted him, and he brought this up. And I've I've snipped out multiple clips. First of all, I'm not going to watch the whole video for you know their own sake and their own creative license and whatever. You can go watch the whole thing. That's fine. Alan Parr is trying to be charitable. I think he's being too charitable at this point. This juncture. Now again, I have some friends call it a dumpster fire. Eh, I mean, maybe that's a little harsh. Maybe they're just trying to be sensational. But it's not good. It's not good. Because even right there, he says, I don't agree with this and that, you know, his view of the Trinity, blah, blah, blah. <coughs> I'm sorry, what? Did you just say you don't agree with his view of the Trinity? Okay. And then this whole video talks about how I'm still going to be in Marcus Rogers' life. I'm still going to be, I'm still going to build a bridge and this is this whole thing. And this is this lingo, be the bridge. This is the woke ideology from, I forget her name, um, uh, Latasha Morrison, I think is the author of that. Be the bridge. And this is telling, you know, light-skinned people to shut up and listen to dark-skinned people, more melon and less melon. Like, it's just stupid. Be the bridge, right? Be the bridge. Building bridges is not walls. That's a total leftist paradigm. That's so, it's just just liberal talking points, okay? That doesn't even mean anything. There's no part in scripture that says be a bridge or be a wall. There just isn't, right? And look at reality. We have bridges and walls, ladies and gentlemen. They're both essential, okay? I live in Kentucky. We have a river, the Ohio River. It's ugly, it's gross. You don't wanna swim across it. You don't wanna take a little boat. You want a bridge, I'm thankful. I can get over to Indiana very easily, or Ohio. Walls are great, including your walls in your church building, your office, your work, your house. You might even have a wall or a fence around your property for your dogs, for your kids, for some creep not walking in. Walls are also helpful. Barriers, also helpful. So to be like, well, we got to do one or the other. No, we don't. We don't have to do either and we don't have to do, we can do both. Okay, so let's just, again, keep that in mind when we're doing these certain things. Not just take these talking points and think, well, I'm, I'm going to build a bridge. Just You guys just need to deal with it. And again, I'm thankful for Parr. He's been around a long time. Uh, I'm not calling him a heretic or anything like that. I think he's greatly mistaken here to continue to associate with Marcus Rogers. I think he should just distance himself and be done, right? But we'll watch this video. Again, it's just snippets of this 15-minute video rather than a bridge, is things that we know about people. There's a beautiful story in the book of Luke, chapter 7, verses 36 through 50, where there is this woman who we know is a sinful woman, and she wants to build a bridge towards Jesus Christ, and she wants to worship him. Notice what the Bible says about this particular woman. It says here, when a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. So apparently she was involved in prostitution, and people around the town knew this about her, so there were some things about this woman that everybody pretty much knew. There was some common knowledge about her. And as a result, this particular Pharisee, whom Jesus was at his home, decided to build a barrier toward this woman rather than building a bridge. But Jesus built a bridge towards her. Notice what the Pharisee says in verse 39. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. So many times we have the tendency to build barriers towards people based on the things that we know. Because we know certain things about people, we have concluded in our minds that this person is not worth me building a bridge towards them. No, rather I'm going to erect a barrier. And that's exactly what this fear Okay, so Pharisee, Jesus, this isn't Mary Magdalene, by the way. A lot of people think that. It's not. Uh, there's actually even questionable evidence whether Mary Magdalene was even a prostitute at all, but that's another, that's another video. <laughs> 737. So this is a whole scenario. So he brings up a verse, and I understand for the sake of time and brevity, he's trying to do that. Now, I'm 
taken a long time here. So we're going to read it, at least some of it. So he says, 737, behold, a woman of the city was a sinner. A sinner just means an outcast because everybody's a sinner. Um, that was just kind of like these people that were outside of Israel, outside the common, you know, maybe people we might call them like uh, riffraff or, or just, I don't know, whatever word you want to use for, for people that are outside your kind of scope. Uh, Pharisee and invited and saw this. If this man was a prophet, meaning questioning Jesus' credentials, he would know this woman is a sinner, blah, 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 blah. And then he goes down, again, for the sake of time. He castigates this Pharisee, right? Jesus does. Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, right? Dirty feet, muddy, ground, dusty, right? Everything else. So you got to wash your feet before you, before you come in. You gave me no kiss. But from the time I came, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You anoint, did not my anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but she is forgiven little, loves little. But he who forgives little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Okay. Now, this reminds me, this is in the same passage, of the woman uh, who's caught in adultery. Right? And that's the same thing. Jesus hanging out with sinners, hanging out with women. And he tells her, go and sin no more. Now, the implication here is the same. Your sins are forgiven. Not so that you can go and continue to sin. The other thing is, too, this woman is coming to Christ. Marcus Rogers isn't coming to uh, Alan Parr. He's also claiming to be a believer. She's not. The other thing is, he's in... I, I don't know. There's just, there's just so much. I, we get it. Let's just move on. This isn't a good analogy. This isn't a good scripture, Alan Parr. Sorry. It's not only the things that we know, but the things that we see about an individual. Now, there's a beautiful story in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 through 13, where Samuel is supposed to go and anoint the next king of Israel. But all he knows is that it's one of Jesse's sons. And so the very first oldest son comes out of the house as Samuel goes to Jesse's house. And notice that Samuel says this. When they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. He says, hey, based on what I see, just looking out the outward, this is somebody that I would like to build a bridge towards, right? But notice what it says. God says, but the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height. For I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So later on, you know the story. David comes out and Samuel anoints. Right. The Lord looks at the heart. We, again, I don't know your heart, Alan. I don't know your heart, Marcus, ultimately. But what we can do is we're called to be Bereans. We're called to be discerning. We're called to sharpen each other as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. The point here, and he's going to say it. I don't know if I'll make it for time or not. But he's going to say it, oh, you're shaming people, this and this and this. I'm not shaming anybody. Now, some people might. I don't know. I'm not. I'm wanting you to be discerning. And I'm helping my listeners, y'all watching, because Alan Parr is probably not going to watch this, <coughs> or Marcus Rogers, but maybe, and maybe somebody who supports them thinks that this is fine. Listen, if you love Jesus, you should want to know the truth. More than anything else, more than a tribe, more than what somebody looks like, more than a denomination, more than your own preferences or anything else. You should want to know what Jesus looks like and what he calls you to do and how he wants you to live and all the rest, right? Everything that's bound up in that. That being said, the Lord looks at the heart. Man looks at the outward appearance. Well, the outward appearance is not good, right? Well, we're looking at the heart. Okay, fine. But then out of the overflow of the heart, Matthew 12, 34 tells us, the mouth speaks out of the abundance. It bubbles up like a boiling pot and eventually the water and the bubbles spill up over because it's exploding out. What's in your heart manifests outside on the flesh, outside in the world, in the culture, in your church, in your family. That's what's going on. And so, well, man looks at the outward appearance. Yeah, sure, if I looked at Marcus Roger, I might be like, yeah, he's a little Looney Tunes, he's a little weird. Eh, he might be a kind of nice guy. I watch a few videos, but he's not really for me. Somebody else might be like, oh, he's so great. Oh, I just love him. And he's got a huge following, and that's a lot of people. Well, hopefully some of you will watch this video, and you'll question the teaching. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> You'll question the teachings of Marcus Rogers more than the personality. This is how Joel Osteen and many others, you know, hook people and they got them in their in their jaw and they're just yanking them in for all the money they're worth. Don't be gullible. Don't be a fool. Please, for your own sake, for the church's sake, for for unbelievers around you's sake. 
to be the next king. But the point is that Samuel may have missed an opportunity to build a bridge towards David because of what no he bridge saw, mentioned. right? And sometimes you and I can build barriers towards people based on the things that we see. Maybe this is not only we can build barriers because of what we know and what we Number see, three. but we often are guilty of building barriers towards people based on the things that we have heard. Now, this is my favorite because in the book of Acts chapter 9, there is a story where Saul, who later becomes the Apostle Paul, has been recently converted and he has been knocked off of his horse and God had blinded him. And so uh, God comes to Ananias and says, hey, I want you to go and lay your hands on this man Saul to receive his sight. And I want you to notice what Ananias' response was. It says here, but Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. He says, see, I've heard about this dude. I've heard about Paul or Saul, right? And I've heard of the things that he's done. And so as well, I don't want to build a bridge towards him at all. Okay. Kim Jong-un. It's the dictator of North Korea. He's like my age, right? He's the third generation in the despotic tyranny that is North Korea. Okay, it's a closed country. It's highly oppressive. The worst place to be a Christian. On and on and on. Like they're always starving. They don't have enough electricity. It's it's a terrible place. So I've heard. I've never been. Kim Jong Un, if he came to Christ, who's tortured people, killed people, put them in the the Gestapo, right? Put them in in the 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 barracks. Not the barracks. What's the what's the word? I can't remember. It. In prison. Um, <laughs> I was looking for a fancier word. Put them in prison, labor camps, hard labor camps. Christians, non, non, and not even Christians, just just people who don't support an atheist regime of North Korea. If he came to Christ, wouldn't you think most people would be a bit suspicious? That's exactly what's happening in Acts nine. It's like yeah, this guy's a domestic terrorist. Are you sure, God? Because. Yeah, like he's 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 killed people, like Stephen and a bunch of other people, and he's dragging people and throwing them in prison. And he thinks the worst part is he thinks he's doing it for God. That's what Saul was doing. So if somebody like a Kim Jong Un, or if you know Bin Laden was still alive, he came to Christ. These terrorists, Al Baghdadi, right? <laughs> like 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 uh, uh, Bashir al Assad, like some of these, you know, in whether your politics, I don't care about that. You know, and how true all the stuff they do, or it's worse, I don't know. But the point is, these men kill people. They're terrorists. They're, they're tyrants. And if they came to Christ, most of us would be like, yeah, right. Like, if Joe Biden came to Christ, we'd be like, uh, mm, no, I don't think so. Like, you look at the outward appearance, the things I've heard. Yeah, I've heard this guy's killing Christians. No, duh. I'm not going to do that. Marcus Rogers isn't doing that, thankfully. He's professing Christ. And it's not about things I've heard. It's things I've seen that he literally just said. And Alan Parr has heard these things directly. So again, another strike. You're already out, Alan. You're already out. You're, you're, you're not making very good headway. This is not good, man. It really isn't. And again, Marcus Rogers folks, if you're watching or other Alan Parr people, this is not this is not necessary, ultimately. You don't need to support this. You need to call this man out, as you did. You pushed him against the fire. He did some political answers. He's contradicting himself. He's doing this, he's doing that. Jesus isn't God, or he's, you know, morphed from a modalism from God the Father to Jesus the Son, and now it's the Spirit. He's now the Spirit. That's what oneness Pentecostal is. It's Unitarianism. Um, it's what Islam believes, where there's just one God. There's no mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. There's nothing, right? It's just God. Well, if there's God, holy God, and us, there's a massive chasm as we see with Anna, Abraham and the poor man, rich man, uh, a rich man and Lazarus, rich man and Lazarus and Abraham. There's a giant chasm fix. It's a problem. That chasm is sin. That chasm is my sin and your sin. We need a bridge, a real bridge, an actual one who mediates, who goes between us. That is Jesus, the God man, right? The one who resisted sin. By shedding his own blood for you. By going to the cross, by taking the shame, despising it, so that we might die to that sin that we once committed, that we once lived in, reveled in, and lived to righteousness. And by his wounds, all that stuff, you're healed. Not me. I'm not, I'm not healing myself for this 50-50 or 98-2 or 99-1 where I just do just a little bit, just a little pinch, just something. No, no. By his wounds, you're healed. His wounds, not yours. So I don't know where you support, if you, whether you're watching, a regular watcher, I appreciate it. If you're not, uh, consider these words. 
right? If you found this helpful, uh, like and subscribe. And if you've already subscribed, please share, please comment. It really, really helps me out. Let's finish this. We've got a couple more minutes. Because of the things that I've heard. I really don't know him. I'm not taking the time to get to know him. I don't see things, but the things that I have heard. And notice the response. It says here, but the Lord said, go for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to the kings as well as to the people yeah. of Israel. Yeah. See, Ananias yeah. had heard about how Paul was killing Christians left and right. And he concluded in his mind, there's no way that God could use such a sinful person as Paul. And so as a result, I'm going to build a barrier towards Paul or Saul at the time rather than building a bridge. But I love this. Later on in this chapter, it happens again. And I want you to notice here that Barnabas chooses to build a bridge towards Saul rather than a barrier. Stay with me because I'm going somewhere with all of this. Notice it says here, when Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to meet with the believers, but they were all afraid of him. Barrier, barrier. They had heard about Paul and all the believers were afraid of Paul and they all built barriers towards Paul. But notice they did not believe he had truly become a believer. Yeah, and you wouldn't either. And that's why this is being documented in the scripture because it's very unusual. But God is a very unusual God, isn't he? And praise God for praise praise him right for that. Because looking back at my life, I didn't come to faith until my early 20s. Looking back at my life and seeing the things that I did, the things that I rebelled, the things that I was, you know, totally duplicitous, the things that I said and 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 didn't do and everything, I it's 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 for me, a wretch like me <laughs> is and I hope that you can say that for you. And if it's not, then you need to question who Jesus is, what your relationship with him really is. Maybe you're an unbeliever. Maybe you're just like, ah, this is just entertaining. This is funny. Well, consider Christ. Consider him because he is not only the God man, but he calls out to repentance. And those who don't repent, at the end of time, they will face their own condemnation. They will own their own judgment. And he will ultimately cast them into the lake of fire. That's a big deal. It's a huge deal. That's why this matters. That's why, partially why I do this channel. One of the main reasons why I do this channel. To use this sphere, as it were, and it's not the only thing, but it is a major thing. To use this to proclaim his glory, his goodness, for your sake and his glory. Barnabas brought him to the apostles, say, bridge, right? Brought him to the apostles and told them how Saul had seen the Lord on the way to Damascus and how the Lord had spoken to Saul. Now, I'm not in any way suggesting that Marcus Rogers or even Alan Parr, for that matter, is the Apostle Paul. Is you saying, I will I'm glad he's not saying he's the Apostle Paul, okay? I'm glad. That's good. An active participant in this particular person's life to help restore them and be a voice. It's about involvement, not two, agreement. Building bridges towards somebody earns the right to correct them when they are wrong. Listen. If Marcus Rogers or anybody else decides to teach <coughs> wrong theology or go left and do all these crazy things. Well, here's the thing, Alan. He already is teaching wrong theology. He's already saying you have to be baptized. If you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, you don't have the Spirit. If you're not speaking in tongues, you don't have the Spirit. That's an evidence of that. You have to do these things, right? You have to be baptized. Not just in the Spirit, but you have to be physically baptized. No, you don't. You don't. You're making it a work. Were people baptized in the Old Testament? No. You have to believe God and it is counted to you as righteousness. Abraham didn't even have a Bible. Now there is the arch of progressive revelation. Yes, there is history that we dealt with. And we now living in 2022 have the most responsibility because we have the most Bibles, not only in our own language, Spanish, Russian, Portuguese, whatever, hundreds of languages, the full text of the scripture is written in. We still need more though. So if you're ever interested in Bible translation, get to work. It is a, is a worthy cause. There's still many languages that don't have the scripture. But Abraham believed God. He didn't get baptized. He wasn't circumcised. He didn't keep the law. He didn't do anything. Why? Because it's not of works so that no one will brag about it. Nobody's going to boast. Nobody's going to say, well, I mean, I kept the law. <laughs> you didn't. You just got it by grace. That's all the better, right? It reminds me so often, and I use this fairly frequently preaching the Pharisee and the tax collector, right? 